So, and now I'm deeply honored to invite our keynote speaker, Dr. Walter E. Brown has been a computer programmer for almost 60 years, and a C++ programmer for more than 40 of these years. So I won't do a poll here who's uh, younger than 40. Um, he joined the C++ standards effort in the year 2000, and has since written over 175 proposal papers. Among his contributions, he's responsible for introducing the standard C++ library features as C begin, C end, common type, void T, and C math mathematical special functions, as well as the headers random and ratio. And if you don't know what any of this is, then welcome to the conference. <laughs> and welcome to C++. He has also impacted this, the, langu the core language itself with features such as alias templates, contextual conversions, variable templates, <clears throat> static assert, and everyone's favorite C++ 20 spaceship operator. So please welcome Dr. Walter E. Brown. Okay. Ah. Test zero one. Yeah. <laughs> A computer is a stupid machine with the ability to do incredibly smart things. While computer programmers are smart people with the ability to do incredibly stupid things. I hear you agree. <laughs> Earlier this year, I had the honor to speak at one of your local meetups in March from my home near Chicago. And I told the following story. It has been my habit when I speak in or to people in a foreign country, I like to say a few words in the native language. So, ani lo midaber ivrit. But, there's more to the story. <laughs> and I wanted, to say, I wanted to say a little bit more. Test zero one. <laughs> Tests. Okay. So what I wanted to say in Ivrit, I do not speak Hebrew, but I know how to use a dictionary and a grammar book. So I put together a few sentences, starting with that one, and I wanted to check my work. And as most of you, I'm sure, know, when you do translations, there can be subtleties. So I consulted Google Targum <laughs> and went back and forth a few times. But I must show you what Google did. These are not English words. Ishkobs, steplastic, and what does cereal have to do with anything? Also, why is it right justified? Okay, well, it's not Hebrew, it's English, but well, pretend English. Anyway, okay, so I wanted to share that with you. I would like us to keep in mind one other item. Sometimes we discover truths that are not very pleasant. And whenever we do this, we are in difficulties. Suppressing them, of course, is scientifically dishonest. So we must tell them. But telling them will fire back on us we will be written off as totally unrealistic, hopelessly idealistic, revolutionary, gullible. And besides that, telling such truths is not without personal risk. 
Vinde Galileo Galilei by Edsger Dijkstra. I never had the opportunity to meet Dijkstra, who's no longer with us. But I understand he had a difficult personality. Nonetheless, if you have not had the pleasure of reading, reading his writings, I strongly encourage you to do so. All of his handwritten papers have been transcribed and are available online. Even if you can only take three or four minutes, they are sometimes not very long at all. But I think this is a good example of how deeply he has thought. I would also like to give you a personal warning about what I'm about to say today. Based on my own training and fairly extensive experience, I do hold some fairly strong opinions about computer software, programming methodology, and of course, our favorite language, C++. I do know that these opinions are not yet shared by all programmers, but they should be. <laughs> Over the years, I've often been asked, why C++? And I would like to tell you that at the time that I settled on C++, a little over 40 years ago, the dominant programming languages included Fortran, APL, PL1, Pascal, all of which I knew pretty well. But none of them really matched the way that I thought about programs and programming. Now, I base that opinion on my experiences at the time. I had already been a professional programmer for almost two decades. I had earned my graduate degrees in computer science after an undergraduate degree in mathematics because there was not yet an undergraduate computer science. I had designed the curriculum for a computer science department from scratch, and I was serving at the, as that department's founding chair. Now, I'm going to do a, a digression for one page. Please bear with me. Since we are at a college, and I know that many of you are interested in curricula, I'd like to share with you for just one page a little bit about that curriculum that I designed 40-some years ago. It was a small, small private liberal arts school which imposed very strict requirements of all graduates. We call them distribution requirements. Right? There was language, there was mathematics, other science, um, philosophy or religion requirements, and so forth. So it was very tight to get a curriculum in. So we ended up with nine required courses for a major. So these were the courses. The first year, one year, two courses of computer programming in one language to establish some expertise. Every time the class met, there was a programming assignment. So there were, I think, 16-week courses. So, you know, two to the fifth programs minimum. Not large, but, you know, we expected our students to do a program for every course. For every class meeting. The second year, four courses. One, data structures and analysis of algorithms, digital electronics, and machine level programming. Not assembly, machine level programming. That was a laboratory course. Three lectures, totaling three and a half hours, plus two laboratories, each of three hours, there was also a one-hour recitation every week. And in the laboratory, our students would build computers and learn how to program them in their assembly language. They were little notebook computers. They were in a notebook. I think, I'm going to, I think I'm going to switch microphones. Please bear with me.
test zero one? Good, thank you. The third course in the second year was Principles of Programming Languages, and the fourth one was Principles of Operating Systems. I think I left off part, I left off part of one of the titles. The, the Computer Architecture and Organizations course also taught assembly language. Three courses in the third year, a system software course, which was a projects course, one project for one term, and a different project every time we offered the course. It could be a text editor, it could be a parser, it could be, you know, whatever, system software. Foundations of computing, which we taught, okay? Things like, well, automata theory, the halting problem. I actually once had a meal with Noam Chomsky, the Chomsky hierarchy. I asked him why he stopped working in this area. He said, and I quote, I didn't want to learn any more mathematics. <laughs> and then we had additional requirements in mathematics and so on and so on. So, uh, I hope some of you found that of interest. Let me go back now to my original story. So when I discovered C++ a little bit over 40 years ago, I was almost immediately comfortable with its facilities for abstraction. Procedural abstraction, data abstraction, etc., etc. But it was another 20 or so years before I started to participate in the standardization process which has the name WG21, Working Group 21. I produced, as you heard, roughly 175. I'm not exactly sure I lost count. But I want to share with you today a few of my successes in C++ in that effort, a few of my failures, and most importantly, some of my unfinished business so far. And along the way, I'd like to acquaint you with the problem that has consumed me for, I think now, slightly over 25 years. I'd like to tell you what's resulted from that effort and what's yet to be done. So, part one. I'm going to talk about operators. Of course, we have our origins in C. So the first publication of KNRC included a table, in fact there were two copies, one in the body of the text and one in the appendix. There were 40 plus operators. And compared to other programming languages at the time, that was considered to be quite a rich set of operators, uncommon for that era. By contrast, for example, Fortran at that time had only about a third as many. I'm fairly confident that that expressiveness contributed to the early popularity of C. It let us, as programmers, express ourselves more fluently, better by some metric, right? But several of those operators were uncommon or even novel at that time. For example, the ternary operator, the conditional operator, right? That was uncommon might have been novel. The sequencing operator, comma, and the pre and post increment operators. And then came C++. Okay. And to this date, we have added roughly 20 more. The scope resolution operator, that's not C. The cast operators, that's not C. Pointer to member, throw, type ID, align of, no accept, co-await, co-yield is new, new and delete, array new and delete, right? And of course the spaceship operator. The uh, size of with an ellipsis for the size of a parameter pack, none of that is C. And by the way, 
permit me to remind you just for your, to bring it back to the front of your brain, that the rules of precedence in C are not always the same as those in C++. The notable difference is the assignment operator as compared to the ternary operator. They're not the same by way of precedence. So keep that in mind from time to time. Okay? Nonetheless, I wish for two more operators. And I'd like to tell you what they are. I actually wrote a couple of papers almost a decade ago proposing one of them. And they were, in, you know, in due course, they were discussed by WG21, unfortunately, while I wasn't in the room. So it's fairly predictable what happened. No. Each time. I, I, I'm still a little bit discouraged that I was not permitted to speak in support, but that's past. But I'm raising that idea again today because you may have some new ideas about it. It was nicknamed the Swapperator. <laughs> Those are my two papers. Now, let me give you a little bit of background and then describe what I intend. Assignment, even a long time ago, has been a subject of a lot of research, especially in the early days. I encourage you, if you're interested, Go find some of those early papers. They are incredibly illuminating. You'll find that the vocabulary has shifted a little bit since then. As a simple example of change in vocabulary, back when I was a graduate student, we didn't have call by value. We had call by copy value, which, Gesundheit, which I still think is superior, but nonetheless. That's an example of what happens to nomenclature as it mutates over time. There was a paper by Barron back in 1963 that would consider the idea of simultaneous assignment. Quote, the general form of an assignment whose operands are two explicit lists with the same number of members denoting a simultaneous assignment of each of the right-hand members to the corresponding left-hand member. Interesting, no? And even 60 years ago, swapping was envisioned. The third of the examples in that paper looked like that. A comma B is assigned B comma A. Now, a later paper from 1976, explained, clarified a little bit, simultaneous multiple assignment allows one to perform an exchange of values by means of a single assignment. I comma J is given J comma I. And if that's concurrent, that makes perfect sense, right? By the way, the colon equal notation comes from a language that was first known as IAL, International Algebraic Language, and was later renamed ALGOL 58, which was later superseded, of course, by ALGOL 60, etc., etc., etc. Yes, I, I knew those languages. Now, that paper continues. The main objection to the use of simultaneous assignment is the potential for ambiguity. And he's got an interesting example. He says the assignment A sub I comma A sub J is given x comma y is ambiguous in case the variables i and j happen to take the same value. What's supposed to happen? Now, as recently as 2009, in a paper by Pike and his colleagues, he observed the following. Exchanging assignment has been used as the basis for the design of a research language named Resolve and associated libraries. Resolve adapted as a discipline for C++ programming has been evaluated in both educational and industrial software settings, including a large commercial software product. And then the paper concludes, in part, 
the swapping paradigm works. It made it not only possible, but remarkably easy to address the data movement dilemma in a way that preserved modular reasoning without sacrificing performance. I like that. Copying was only occasionally required in our application, and we think this would be the rule in many applications. We attribute the remarkably clean bug report history of this product family to the relatively simple reasoning about behavior that resulted from this one most important design decision. Now, beyond that kind of research interest, exception-free swapping plays an important and, in many cases, critical role, for example, in recognized C++ patterns like copy and swap and commit or rollback. And there are many names for these idioms, right? Especially when there are resources that need to be managed, as in assignment operators and transactional code, right? Informally, this is often explained as, hello, sorry about that. First prepare the work off to the side and then only then swap the results into place and acquire a lock in between if you need to, right? But it took us, the C++ community, many years just to learn how to invoke standard swap correctly in the generic case. And the, the result has always been bring the standard swap into scope and then call swap unqualified so that in case you have your own overload of swap, it's going to be called if it's the better match. We let overload resolution do the work. It took years to learn that and to understand it, and it is still not all that commonly taught in my experience, which is unfortunate. Nonetheless, it, the status is a little, little bit better today. Not a lot, but a little bit better. Recently, as I'm sure many or most of you know, we acquired another swap in the ranges sub namespace. And that version of swap is specified as a CPO, a customization point object, which in C20 is defined as a function object that interacts with program defined types, in other words, my types and your types, while enforcing semantic requirements. And ranges swap incorporates the two-step dance. Well, the equivalent of that two-step dance, right? So that generic client code doesn't have to remember to do that anymore. And you are free to overload in your own namespace, and if it's the better match, right, the CPO will find it and call it for you without your having to do the two-step dance. So my current thinking about this is as follows. We need either a customizable swap operator, I propose colon equals colon as the spelling for symmetry, right? Or at least, I believe we should have a core language solution that subsumes and greatly simplifies CPOs because they are not trivial to write. They're not extraordinarily difficult once you get the hang of it, but there's initially a fairly steep learning curve. I see people are nodding, yeah. Yeah, I've been there, I've done it. And maybe both of those should be reconsidered, and I invite you to think about it, and perhaps let's talk about it later. Now, I said I was looking for two operators. Let me tell you about the second one. What I'd like to see is an implication operator, a right-pointing double arrow, is the usual notation in mathematics, right? And this is not really used in C++ except in one very specific place. And I think maybe we even did away with that. I can't remember right now. I have found it over time increasingly useful to have. I keep saying I wish I had this. Especially, well, at least initially I was writing my own concepts, which I've been doing for, I'm approaching a decade now. Okay. Um, but 
Also, there are many other contexts. I'll show you on the next page a couple more examples of where I would find it useful. And what I would like are the, are the, you know, the customary mathematical uh, semantics. Namely, if I have two bool values, let's say P and Q for the time being, then I'd like to define the behavior of this operator as, well, I mean, look at the truth tables, right? It's not P or Q. Yes, I know those parentheses are redundant, but not everybody but knows precedence, so you know, I put them in for clarity. Okay? You really can't write this in C++ because of the short circuiting. You cannot write your own function that does this without evaluating both P and Q. I don't know any way to do it. The closest I have come is with a macro. And here are two candidates for your inspection. And yes, I know I can write this with a ternary operator, but then every time somebody looks at my code and sees this ternary operator, they have to say, wait a minute, that's implication. And in my experience, most programmers just don't do that. They don't get there. And I believe that the, an operator that does this would be at least helpful and, in my opinion, very useful to have. Hello. Forwards, please. Thank you. There we go. All right. I believe it would simplify my coding, and I believe it would simplify your coding as well. Here are my two examples. Part of the specification of unique pointer says, if the deleter's type D is not a reference type, then D shall meet the, the certain destructible requirements. That's an implication. I'd like to write it as one. Today, I have to write it this way with the macro. You know, I, I mean, and assume those things are, are concepts, right? Okay? I'd really rather write that with an operator. Here's another example. Part of the spe specification of optional, optional has an equality operator, and here's what it says to return. And these are direct quotes from the standard. You can look them up, of course. And the minimum that I'd like to be able to write to do that is this return statement. And yes, I know it can be collapsed a little bit further, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a starting point. That's an implication. If there's an if then, that's an implication. Okay? It is the same reasoning that applies in other contexts. For example, in courts of law. If you are making a promise based on a condition, if it is raining, then I will carry an umbrella. What does that mean? Well, if it's raining and you see me carrying an umbrella, I've kept my promise. If it's raining and I haven't carried, I'm not carrying an umbrella, I've lied. If it's not raining, have I broken my promise? No. True. The promise is inapplicable. That's implication, right? And in my experience, there are many, many more opportunities for application of an implication operator for your consideration. Think about it. Let's talk about it later, if it intrigues you. Okay, part two of my talk. I want to talk about terminology, nomenclature. I believe that we as a community all too often use nomenclature that is, well, let me be a little bit genteel about it, suboptimal. I have stronger language. It can be, uh, no, 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 it, it can be a pain in the neck, right? But I have a lower opinion. Okay. Nomenclature in my dictionary. The devising or choosing of names for things. Nomenclature. Naming. Names are important. Now, don't make a mistake here. I, I'm not proposing in any way that it's feasible to change at this date many of our existing nomenclatures, right? because we won't be understood anymore or we ha everybody has to relearn half the world. 
okay? I mean, there's a case in point. A lot of people who are new to IOTA are terribly confused as to why it's named IOTA. And if you don't know APL, it's not intuitive. IOTA, spelled with a Greek letter IOTA, is what APL used for that operator. That's why we named it IOTA, okay? APL started out not as a programming language. It started out having been devised by Ken Iverson, Kenneth Iverson, may he rest in peace. It was his mathematics notation and people started to adopt it and turned it into a programming language. Um, I did my doctoral dissertation involving APL. But as far as nomenclature is concerned, I encourage certainly that our community individually and jointly increase our awareness of the importance of vocabulary. And in the next few pages, I'd like to show you some examples of what I mean when I say we are using nomenclature that I at least consider suboptimal. And I literally could find you dozens and dozens and dozens more examples. But I'll stick to just a small handful. Let me talk about arrays first. Does an array have a bound or does it have an extent? Well, let's see what the standard says. If we have an n element array like that, the standard says that n specifies the array bound, the number of elements. Fine. And then we go look at the standard library and we have type traits using the nomenclature extent. Don't you think one word is enough? And why do we want an array bound that's larger by one than its upper bound. I mean, shouldn't the upper bound be the bigger one? Isn't that technically an out of bound value? To me, that just, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think that's suboptimal nomenclature. And wouldn't it be better in any case to be consistent? And I have to confess, I tried. I wrote a, a two papers arguing for consistency and in favor of extent. But again, both times, those papers were discussed without me in the room, and each time they were rejected. But I'm not bitter. <laughs> Second example, iterators. We've been taught for a very long time in the standard library that when you have a sequence that has an end iterator, it denotes past the end. I'm sorry, I can't drive off the end of a street, can I? At least I shouldn't. And I can't tell you how many, especially novices to C++, are totally baffled by that nomenclature. It is simply unintuitive, in my opinion, and in theirs. And the confusion resolves once I say instead that end denotes past the last. I can drive past the last house on the street. I can't drive past the end of the street. There's a small difference. And I find that past the last is both euphonious, it sounds good, it rhymes a little bit, and it's more intuitive. Okay? But there's an alternative, maybe an, an idea for your consideration. Maybe we should also design another kind of iterator that denotes not values, but boundaries. A place between two values. Always fictional, never dereferenceable, but you can talk about it. I can talk about the end of something, right? Without saying it's the last thing, right? If I put something in a box, the box has a boundary. It doesn't have much to do with what's in the box. Okay, And for what it's worth, I believe that other people have come up with a similar idea. I believe there do exist libraries that implement something like this or some mixture of classical and these new iterators. I have no direct experience with them, but again, something for you folks to think about. Third example, classes. 
We all know that C++ has class types. So, don't shout out answers, but think about the following question. If T is a class type, is it a class? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, don't shout out the answers. <laughs> That's all right. And as an example, we have a type trait is class. So does that type trait tell me whether T is a class type? Again, no. Because we have types that are classes and we have class types and they're not the same. I really wish it weren't that way. A union type is a class type, but it's not a class. It's a union. By definition, if you have a type that's declared with one of those three what are called class keys, it's a class type, but they're not all classes. Shouldn't we adopt something that's a little bit more intuitive or at least different, like class-like type? I mean, a union is sort of like a class. It has many of the same properties, but there's an important difference. It's class-like, but it's not the same thing for your consideration. Here's another example, an operator. Consider the unary operator star. What do we call it? What do we term it? Is it the indirection operator? Or is it the dereference operator? The core language says the unary star operator performs indirection. The standard library says each iterator is dereferenced and uses that vocabulary in lots of places. That's why I put in the ellipsis. You'll find that in lots of places. And while we're talking on this subject, how should we name some entity which internally dereferences an iterator? Well, here are some samples from the standard library. We have iter swap, we have iter value t and iter move, we have indirect result t, indirectly readable, and indirect binary pre pre uh, predicate. Oops, a little consistency please. It's not so much that consistency is such a great virtue, in my opinion, but I consider inconsistency a vice. It makes it harder, certainly, to teach and learn and then remember. I don't like to see inconsistencies. And I've read thousands and thousands of lines of code where one function terms something last name and another function terms the same thing, family name, and a third one uses different nomenclature, etc., etc., etc. No, we shouldn't do that. We all know that. And yet, one more example here. Do we say that a function is no accept or no throw? <clears throat> well, we do both. Oops. Yeah. Now, ironically, I might actually be partly responsible for that. Because back in 2004, I wrote a paper as part of which, it was not the main thrust, but part of that paper proposed a new qualifier, no throw, to be applied to function declarations. Well, that paper wasn't adopted, but more or less a decade later, we got no accept in the core language. But the library still uses no throw in the type traits. Oops. I'll do one more. C23 is about to add new functions named remove prefix and remove suffix. Awful. If you look at the interface for these new functions, there's no affix 
in the interface. Affix is the general term for prefix, postfix, infix. Right? What these functions do is trim from one or the other end of, say, a string. So why aren't they named trim front and trim back? I don't specify a prefix. I specify a length in the interface. And while we're talking about front and back, shouldn't push back have been named append? And push front is prepend, perfectly good word. It's been around a very long time. One more personal opinion. I really wish standard function had been named standard callback. That's much closer to its intended use and use case. You're entitled to your opinion, but I'm entitled to mine, and you're entitled to hear mine, so hush. Okay. So all I'm asking for to wrap up this part is that we be more aware of the impact of our naming choices. We are typically the producers of names. And although we are also consumers, we are not usually the principal consumers. So let's think more about how our choices of names will be perceived. And let me wrap up this with comments by a few other people, many names I think you will recognize, not all in computing. Nothing means anything but the proper names. We cannot improve a science without improving the language or nomenclature. For a single genus, a single name. You won't get your names right the first time. Yeah, I know. You may well be tempted to leave it. After all, it's only a name. But humans need good names. Demand good names from yourself and from those around you. Why should we bother? Because finding good names is a journey of discovery. The names we choose shape the dictionary we use to talk and think about our software. If we can't find a good name, we obviously don't know enough about either the problem domain or the solution domain. Okay. Let me change the subject. There's one more feature I'd like to see in the core language. It's a fairly decently sized feature, but let me introduce it slowly, if you don't mind. For a roughly the latter third of the 1900s, the mainstream applied computing world was widely seen as divided into two major camps, business computing, which was implemented mostly in COBOL, and scientific computing, which was implemented mostly in Fortran. Okay? Certainly not exclusively in either case, but dominant. And yes, there were also some attempts that weren't terribly successful to meld the two. That was the basis of the design of PL1. PL1, by the way, is interesting for other reasons. It was one of the early languages that was formally specified in a specification language named VDL, the Vienna Definition Language. Interesting. And of course, yeah, there were also some research languages like Algol, Lisp, APL, and you know, dozens and dozens and dozens more. There was a very well-respected computer scientist whose life's work was producing a book with a paragraph or two or three about each known programming language. It took her years and years and years to compile. And even after it was published, it really wasn't finished. But I want to tell you about something that I can think was very courageous that happened roughly 1996 or so. There is a community of physicists called high energy physicists. And they decided to break away from Fortran and adopt C++. That decision was controversial because it meant updating a large, and I do mean large, body of proven, i.e. debugged, working Fortran. 
But I must tell you that they have stuck with it to this day with considerable success. They are one of our rather significant success stories. But why am I telling you this? Of course, I'm not a physicist. I happened to join that community roughly at that time. At first, mainly to help rebuild and extend the infrastructure code that needed to be rewritten in order to support two very, very large experiments that were being constructed. Let me digress from just, for just one moment uh, to share with you a personal story. There was a time, let's say 15 or so years ago, when I was very, very ill. I was given about a month to make a critical decision. And I ended up in the hospital where I died, but I was in the hospital. I was released after not quite a week, but I was told to stay away from work for at least six weeks. And I was confined to my home except for short walks around the block. So after six weeks, I couldn't wait to get out of the house. <laughs> The, my first day back, as I was driving to the campus, I noticed I, was, I stopped at the last traffic light before I entered the campus. And looking across the street, I noticed that in my absence, the road had been resurfaced, repaved. It was now bright, shiny, no cracks, no bumps, all repaired, beautiful. And as I crossed the street, a little bit in, not very far, I saw a sign that looked like this. Hello. Because they wanted to preserve their nice, new, shiny road. And of course, this is what they had in mind. Big, heavy, lumbering vehicles that could break this nice, new road, right? But in my eagerness to get back to C++ coding, I remember distinctly, I'm driving, I see this new sign, and I said, what are they talking about inside my head? I mean, what's an abstract truck? <laughs> okay, back to the main story. As a result of my working on the high energy physics infrastructure, I was inspired to develop on my own a new library. I ended up writing a few papers about that and the problems that it could solve. And then I was asked to give a presentation at a so-called CHEP conference. CHEP stands for Computers in High Energy Physics. And they had a conference every 18 months. And that talk, which by the way was my first ever PowerPoint presentation, was aimed at physicists who programmed but they had at that time only limited C++ knowledge and experience, right? So that was the intended audience. Now, I'd like you to see that talk in just a few moments, and I'll tell you why. But I'd like you to keep in mind that every one of you who's listening today is far more knowledgeable and experienced than the original audience members of a roughly 25 years ago. So that original talk which was an hour, is going to go much more quickly today. And afterwards, I'd like to describe how that project has influenced C++ over the years since then and what I believe is still needed. So, let me do a separate talk, a double talk, if you will, not double talk. Okay, a talk within a talk. So... Let me click. The Library of Units-Based Computation. Always start with Latin, right? Can't go wrong by quoting Descartes. I'm discussing units-based computation, historical precedents, advice, dimension checking as static type checking and 
in theory and how a numeric computation was being practiced, okay? Then I talk about SI units, the new library, et cetera, et cetera, right? Sort of a traditional scientific talk, right? Background, new results, okay? The basis of scientific computation, can't go wrong by quoting Galileo. Can't go wrong by quoting the Bible. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I, at the time I didn't realize this isn't a great translation, but it's from a, a theoretically reliable source. Okay? And we've made progress. What is this? Uh, Melachim Aleph? Yes? Okay. So if you do the math, back then pi was 3. All right? Can't go wrong by quoting from the Magna Carta. Standard measures of wine, ale, and corn. Well, they got the alcohol right. So what are the first principles? From a textbook. In carrying out any calculation, always attach the proper units. You should check the dimensions of all the equations. You can spot an erroneous equation by checking the dimensions, right? Teaching beginners in the sciences. But the, there are parallel pr principles in software, too. Really? Yeah. There was a substantial body of computing research. Remember, these are physicists. They didn't know this. Research in type checking, right? Research at that time showed that what they called type faults were responsible for somewhere between 30 and 80 percent of detectable software mistakes. They found that impressive. And type errors, as we all know, but they didn't back then, are often manifestations of very simple conceptual mistakes. Compilers, as we know, are good at doing type checking. And C++ in particular is famous for strong type checking, right? But this is not a new idea. Can't go wrong by quoting Aristotle. And this was someone who corresponded with me about my library, but he didn't want to be identified. Doesn't that code look tempting? It's wrong. <laughs> Unit errors are costly. This was hot off the press back then. The Mars mission that crashed because of a unit's mistake, right? The problem was never caught and corrected. Now I'm telling them what you can do with static type checking documentation, information for a compiler that can produce more efficient code. They like to hear about efficient code, of course, we all do. Error detection early, i.e. during compilation, they like that. How do you get there? Data abstraction. Data abstraction was a big deal in the 80s and 90s, huge, okay? Object-oriented technology, hot off the presses back then but not all numbers are created equal. So what are we doing today, not 25 years ago? I really looked at a lot of physics-oriented code. I really did. I mean, thousands of lines of code. And what I saw is a lot of use, of the native note of the types, right? Like double for the most part. Occasional and inconsistent use of aliases for double. These are relatively well-known physics software libraries. But of course these are inadequate. It doesn't prevent you from doing that nonsense. It doesn't prevent you from doing things like that. Nonsense. Right? The point is that at that time arbitrary combinations compile. 
the limitations were that early languages just didn't have enough expressiveness. Originally, our data types were limited to those available in the hardware, and they were of general utility that seemed to suffice because we didn't know what we were missing. Programmer-defined data types came later. But they still lacked enough power for generic programming. But now, 25 years ago, we can do better. Because modern, 25 years ago, C++, gives us extra expressive power that we didn't have elsewhere. Classes were new. Namespaces were novel. Templates were unheard of. And to be honest, compilers had issues with templates back then. But those problems were solved. And data abstraction has evolved, right? In particular, static type checking became the norm. Here's my sales pitch. We should adopt, adapt to and adopt this kind of machinery. OK, now my project. It's an application of the technology to computation involving physical concepts. Easy to express, general utility based on existing standards Nomenclature, this is not new for me, nomenclature from our problem domain with no performance penalties. A quick survey of some of the related work from back then. Highlights from my project. Based on the international system of units, which specifies base and derived quantities, most of you probably know all of this, right? Featuring compile time static type checking, which permits only meaningful combinations and forbids expressions that are incommensurate. And it can figure out what the dimensions should be under many cases, right? No runtime overhead, they like that. No extra memory space, they like that. No extra time. Very small initialization costs for I.O. And they really like this. Five models of the universe. We all live most of the time using what we back then named the standard model. But if you look at Einstein's equation e equals mc squared and claim that that says that energy and mass are the same thing, well, that's not true unless c equals 1, right? But that's another model of the universe, which physicists from time to time use, as I'm sure many of you know. And as you set one more and one more and one more constant of nature to one, you get a different model of the universe. And the models are upwardly compatible. Well, my library did all of that. Dimensions turned into types. I had the base seven. I had a lot of derived types. Units behave as right-hand constants. I'll show you examples in just a moment. Multiples and submultiples. Okay. Code. I can declare a variable of type length, and it's implicitly zeroed. Two and a half meters is a good initialization for something of type length, or 1.2 centimeters, or you know five times the previous one that's a length, because I can scale a length, right? Scalar times a length is a length, etc. And this is not permitted. I can't multiply lengths and claim the result is a length. It ought to be an area, right? Etc. Right. I handled output. And if you didn't like the default, you could change it to whatever units you wanted, as long as they were commensurate. I defined synonyms. If you want to talk about length and width, well, I know that width is a length, but you know, maybe you want to call it width. That's fine. And a few more examples a little bit closer to what physicists would do. And now I have a, a literal case study. Here's code that I wrote. Let me first tell you the problem. 
It doesn't matter if you understand it. This is taken from a reliable source. Okay? There's a physics phenomenon called Bremsstrahlung. Okay? I understood none of this, but I can read equations and formulas from a standard source. Okay, I simplified it very, very slightly for the purposes of exposition. And here's the code. Here's the interface, the inputs to the calculation of the final energy. I was given a material. I need the properties of the material. Whatever it is, I need its atomic weight, I need its atomic number, and so forth. There's some constants called size values. I have no idea what they stand for, but this is how you calculate them. Calculate the radiation length, and then calculate the final energy, return, done. Okay? Threw that into my compiler. And back then we were using, um, we were using GCC, we were using the Microsoft compiler version 6.0, I think, which was unchanged for something like six years and resulted in my having a heart attack. Not a joke. Um, and we were using the so-called CHI compiler, which no longer exists. It was bought out by Intel, KAI, Cook and Associates. They were really good at optimization very good at optimization. None of them could compile this because it's wrong. Code is wrong. We made a mistake because of the nomenclature that misled. That should not have been declared as a length. A radiation length is not a length. I'm not a physicist. I didn't know the difference. A radiation length is what they call an effective uh, thickness. It's a distance that's been adjusted according to the density of the material. Okay? So the appropriate declaration should be for something that I ended up labeling an area density. Okay? So I corrected it, recompiled. Sorry. I had made a transcription error, right? Right there. It's the correct formula, but it's the reciprocal of what I need. Oops, my mistake. Here's the correction, one over that stuff in red. Okay. Done. Compiles. Nope, nope. Sorry. Flat out physics error. That part's wrong. It's a conceptual error that's suggested by the original nomenclature. Neglecting to adjust the thickness for density. The correction is that. Need an extra multiplication. And then it compiled. Yay, I saw units. Somebody wrote to me, these are insidious bugs, very hard to find by proofreading because you, your brain knows what it's supposed to be, right? I think it's happened to every one of us at some point, perhaps often even. Okay? It was a summary, a small, simple application. We found three different kinds of errors for three different reasons. And without my library, it would have compiled right off the bat because everything would have been a double and would have just worked and given answers and we might not have noticed that the numbers are wrong. Depends on how carefully you check, right? Would have been very hard to find the causes but we were able to pinpoint the exact lines that were in trouble. Now, I had to admit, especially 25 years ago, that if you did get a diagnostic, you got a huge diagnostic. 
We've all heard stories of thousands of lines of diagnostics. It's not a story, it's true, okay? But now, that's vastly improved, and more so using concepts as well, okay? Choice of data representation, choice of calibration. What do you mean by one? I mean, it's called a unit. Mu and I means one, right? Uni, etc. Choice of model. Here are some examples. I had a lot of names in there. Names that physicists would be very comfortable with. A lot of units, both SI and a lot of miscellaneous ones, a bunch of constants. And this was extensible. You can add your own. New models if you want, okay? Other compatibility issues. Requirements, you need a modern, 25 years ago, modern C++ compiler, extensively tested, particularly with Kai. Visual C++ functionally was compromised. Sorry for uh, belaboring that. Uh, my apologies to those of you who are Microsoft employees. I couldn't resist the quip, okay? All right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And that was the selling point right there. Somebody said to me, this is the first really good reason I've seen to switch from Fortran to C++, and that tipped us over the brink, okay? So, so much for that talk. Okay. So now let me tell you the outcome of my having written that library, okay? I was not satisfied, but I've been thinking now for 25 years, what do I need from C++ to make that library better? Because I think it's an important problem to solve, preferably, of course, in C++. So I'll just tell you what some of the outcomes are. I don't claim that I did all of these things. But I was in the room, I was part of the discussion, I corresponded with people who were working on these things. You know, some of them added my name to their papers, thank you very much, I appreciate it. But what we got as an outcome, in the core language, we got variable templates, which I knew I needed for constants of nature, if nothing else. It was very clumsy without. By the way, in case you're curious, what did we have to do to the language of the standard to get variable templates? We had to remove one sentence. We took out a restriction. I suspect the language has mutated a little bit over the last however many years, but nonetheless, that's the original change to the standard, and we got variable templates. Um, I had some influence on template aliases. The original paper offered two choices of semantics. I lobbied hard in favor of one. That's what we're stuck with today. In the standard library, the header chrono, which is Howard Hinnant's work, he took a lot of stuff that I had done in SI units, including the header ratio, which essentially is mine. The type trait common type, which took about a decade to get right, by the way. It is incredibly subtle to get right. Um, the metafunction void t, which was presented to the world in, I think, the first public talk I gave after I retired, 2014. Uh, what I call the detection idiom was influenced by SI units. And I know several other people have written or are still working on unit-based computation. For those of you who aren't deep into the bizarre names of certain units, let me go very quickly. Talk about a barrel. What it means depends on what's in the barrel. No joke. Barrel of oil is 42 gallons. A barrel of beer is 31 and a half gallons. A barrel of dry goods is 105 dry quarts. Seriously. A dash is somewhere between a 16th and an eighth of a teaspoon. Seriously. That's the definition. A pinch is half a dash. Seriously. A smidgen is half a pinch. A pat of butter is a tablespoon. A drop, 
okay? A point of rain. The jiffy is a unit of time. But if you're a computer engineer, it's roughly 10, roughly 10 milliseconds. If you're a physicist, it's a time that light takes to traverse the size of a nucleus. A ream used to be 480 sheets of paper, but nowadays it's 500. Thank you very much. Seriously, a hogshead of wine, and there's a double hogshead, which is the same as a pork pipe. There's a butt, no joke, don't laugh, there's a butt. It's about 132 gallons. A Mickey is a tenth of a milliliter, give or take. Millimeter, sorry. It's the smallest detectable unit of a computer mouse. It's a Mickey. I mean, what else would you name it, right? <laughs> All right. Back to C++. There have been proposals for standardizing the units library, but I can't support any of them, at least not yet. So let me tell you why not. Some of them, their scope is just too broad, right? I mean, if you're really going to do units in full generality, you at least have to consider currency, and that's just a minefield because it changes at least on a daily basis, if not more often, right? And dimensions that are just beyond the scope of, of SI, incredibly difficult if you want to standardize it. If you let people define their own, it's inherently not people, not portable, because somebody else can define the same thing differently. It's not portable. You can't put it in the standard if you can't use the same thing everywhere, right? And some of them, sorry? Um, um, I understand. Okay. Some people's libraries just don't support I.O. Some don't support the models of the universe. I think mine is probably the only one that did. At least I haven't seen another one that does. But that's important to what I think is an important constituency of ours. Some, in fact most, don't let you do anything with matrices. Terribly important when you have mixed units. Think of a space-time vector. Right? Three spatial coordinates and one time coordinate. What are you going to do with a matrix? I understand that that problem is well on its way to solution. I've seen a couple of talks. Okay? And a lot of them just don't do anything with the standard functions like trigonometry. If I give you an angle measure, I want to take its sine, etc. Okay? I think we need all that. I really do. And as I said at the outset, I think we need one more core language feature. It's been widely recognized. It's been widely written about. I've written five papers on the topic. Okay? I will tell you that there is strong and very vocal opposition in WG21. And literally, after one of my presentations, I was yelled at in committee. No joke. I still have the scars. I still believe that if we had this feature, units would be one of its very important early use cases, and so let me tell you very quickly about it. I'm very close to finishing up. I think we need what's been variously called either an opaque or a strong type def in the core language. Okay? The type defs we have, we, we, we describe as transparent because the underlying type and the alias are mutually substitutable, right? I can do an alias for unsigned and name it score and then write a penalize function, for example, to you know, reduce the score. I can have an alias for a serial number that's also an unsigned, and I can say, well, what's the next serial number? But I can't enforce the distinction, right? I could penalize a serial number or I could ask for the next ID of a score, and the compiler won't complain. If we had an opaque type def, we'd get a new type that can't be substituted for the underlying type, nor vice versa. I think that's a huge plus. But you also now have to think about operations on such types. You know, it's reasonable to add two scores, but it's not probably meaningful to multiply two scores. I don't know what a square score is. But you can't prevent it with a traditional type def. A container's iterator type could be an alias for a pointer in some implementations. And that has happened. So I've seen programmers that treat iterators as interchangeable with pointers, and then when they upgrade or update their library or replace the library, 
and the library uses a class type as an iterator type, oops, their code breaks. Okay? It wouldn't happen if we had a strong type def. And I've also sometimes wanted to overload with one function that takes an argument of underlying type and the other one takes an argument of alias type. Well, you can't do that because they're indistinguishable. It sees those as the same two functions today. There's also an issue that I've called the return type issue, right? Here's a really simple example. I know we don't, I mean, we rarely use the unary plus, right? But that's just here to give you an illustration, okay? If I have an opaque type def, and I declare a variable of that type, and then I say, what's the type of the result of unary plus of the opaque type? Well, it turns out to be that sometimes what you want is the underlying type. Sometimes what you want is the opaque type. Sometimes what you want is some third type, which perhaps you will get out of uh, something like common type or other ways. And sometimes we should just disallow the operation and so there's no return type. Only the programmer knows the intent and so we have to give the programmer the power to say so. So how does all this relate to a unit's library? Well, what we do today and have done for decades is to wrap a type to create a new type. I mean, that's what Chrono does. That's what my units library did 25 years ago, right? And the duration template is such a type wrapper, right? The wrap type is what's called the representation type. And a duration is akin to an SI time dimension. There's the connection. In my opinion, it would be better to create an opaque type instead of a wrapper, especially if we give the programmer the facilities and perhaps a few more that I've suggested to you. So what I hope is that some of you are interested enough to finish the design and then implement this facility in a compiler so that we can get some experience, iron out whatever issues might remain and then we can submit another proposal with a better chance of success. And so, please let, no, please let me finish. I'm, I'm, I've gone over my allotted time and I apologize for that. But we did start a little late. I want to thank Core C++ tremendously for inviting me to your opening keynote. You don't know how much it means because I've just given what will likely be my last public C++ talk, at least for a while. After, I'm sorry, 60 years roughly of computing and computing education, more than 40 of which as a C++ practitioner, more than 20 years participating in C++ standardization, it just seems time for me to take a rest. I have one final commitment. After CPPCon, I'm giving a tutorial two-day workshop. So please let me thank all of you for coming to hear an old man muse about C++. I want to thank you all for your collective support over the years. It's your turn now. Shalom.